I'm very pleased to welcome all of you here to this very, very important topic, and it is uh, uh, and, and this panel discussion focusing on in how international donor assistance is helping accelerate our efforts to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals globally. Uh, this panel is going to be uh, focusing uh, a bit from the panelists that we have with us on the UAE Caribbean Renewable Energy Fund, UAE CREF, and evaluating where we are today and what needs to to, for we have in hand to move forward. So please join me in welcoming our panelists today. We have His Excellency Wilfred Arthur Abrahams, the Minister of Energy and Water Resources of Barbados. Thank you. Mr. Adil Hosseini, Operation Department Director at the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development. and my colleague and friend, Ella Bodias, and the head of energy services at Monster. So we have been hearing all over, you know, in the last few days about renewable energy and how it's gaining significant uptake up against, uh, across the world. But, you know, we see individuals, corporate governments bringing to understand how what's the value it has to push for greater uh, adaptation and areas of application. And, and I believe that the Caribbean island nations have a great opportunity to leverage this important source of energy to achieve not just their own development goal through the Climate Resilient Renewable Energy Projects, but also important uh, global milestones, including creation for jobs, greater diversity, inclusion, gender parity, and other uh, other uh, fields of renewables. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this panel and I'm very excited to hear uh, from all of you. And if, if, you, if I may start with you, Your Excellency, how do you see the international development donor assistant helping small island, uh, small island states developing uh, and, and tackling their development challenging and optimizing the use of their natural resources? Um. Thank you for having me. All right. I just want to say good afternoon to everybody. For us small island developing states, we face a very real prospect of the annihilation of our population occasioned by climate change. We know what needs to be done. The world needs to move away from its fossil fuel addiction. We need to do our part because being among the lowest contributors to greenhouse gases, we are among those who are most affected by the effects of climate change. Absolutely. In my own country, Barbados, Barbados is 24 miles long and I think 16 miles wide at its widest part. We are 166 square miles. And one hurricane can completely wipe out our entire country. So the government of Barbados has made a policy decision to become 100% fossil fuel free by 2030. And we're pushing to make that happen. But the reality for a lot of us in the Caribbean is that many of us are in IMF programs or under other kinds of structural adjustments where our fiscal space is exceedingly limited. We know what we want to do, but we don't have the resources to actually get there by ourselves. So we depend upon foreign donors. The, the gift that we received um, of solar installations with our water, Barbados Water Authority, one was a 500 kilowatt installation at Bowmanston, and the second one was a 350 kilowatt um, solar car port. Now, those have gone a long way to accelerating the government's policy and the government's program. They cost 2.34 million US dollars. It was timely when it was done, but the government was in no way, no way in any position to undertake that expense. Then we had more significant expenses, like trying to right our economy and recover from our um, global debt. So the reality is we as Caribbean nations, we as small nations actually cannot achieve the sustainable development goals or can't advance our renewable energy policies in any significant way without outside help. And by outside help, I mean grant funding, not even low-cost loans, grant funding. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. For those of you who, who don't know, actually, the uh, Caribbean Fund, the UAE Caribbean Renewable Energy Fund, is a $50 million uh, dollar, uh, fund commitment from uh, the UAE to deliver grant funded renewable energy projects across Caribbean nations. That brings me to my colleague, Adel. 
can you, uh, you know, we know that this fund is building on, uh, is building climate change resilient renewable energy projects on those nations. How are those projects helping, uh, helping those nations reduce their reliance uh, on, on fossil fuel and, and, and why the UAE is doing that? Thank you, Dr. Nawal, for the opportunity also to share uh, some thought on behalf of the Fund for Development about uh, today's topic. But let me start with uh, some strategic direction about the importance of... Uh, so as a development fund, uh, uh, we are committed and encourage others also to follow the common principle of uh, effective international cooperation, ultimately promoting uh, country uh, ownership building inclusive partnership, partnership between donors and private sector and civil society, and also ensure transparency and accountability. This is bring us back to the cooperation we have in implementing the Caribbean uh, uh, fund in uh, Caribbean regions. So uh, such initiatives uh, is a great example of how donors and relevant parties, including beneficiary countries, are accelerating and supporting uh, uh, the, the, the efforts to achieve the national uh, uh, sustainable development goals. So, for example, uh, namely, uh, uh, goal number seven, affordable and clean energy. Goal number uh, nine, uh, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, reduce inequalities, climate action, and goal number 17, of building partnership. So basically, this is um, what we do in a close cooperation with other stakeholders, including the beneficiary countries, to assure assisting the beneficiary countries in uh, achieving the sustainable development goals. That's fantastic. And, and, and we heard actually throughout the, 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 the couple of days ago and just now in the previous panel on the importance of the engagement of the private sector. So that brings me to, to you, uh, Bodhi. Uh, what, what is the role of MASTER, and how did MASTER bring innovation into these projects? Thank you, Dr. Nawal, and thank you uh, to my co-panelists. It's an honor to be uh, with you this afternoon. Uh, first of all, building on what His Excellency, uh, the Minister, extended before, the UAE, on, uh, through MASTER, we share a common vision for the role that renewables can play in helping to accelerate economic growth. Now, the projects that we're doing, what sort of impact do they have quite a lot of uh, perspectives. Firstly, they're helping the countries to provide clean and sustainable energy. So there's a reduced cost of energy provision, there's a less dependency on uh, fossil fuels, but also in parallel, the impacts the projects have, including uh, creating jobs, but also boosting gender equality. On a much more technical level, the innovations, some of the innovations that uh, Mazda helps to bring based on our experience and expertise from green projects all over the world, which we then bring to bear on these projects, is looking at uh, tailor-made solutions for each of the countries. We don't just look at uh, energy provision from the point of view of uh, the solar project or the wind project, but we often try to find other uses of the energy as well. So for instance, in the case of uh, the project which we have for Barbados, we're not only building a, a solar PV uh, plant, but also it's a car park that provides uh, shaded parking, which uh, visitors to a stadium can use. That car park structure also provides electric vehicle charging, so we're helping to develop the infrastructure to build the electric vehicle network for the country. Elsewhere, in other projects, we also have uh, some parking spaces that have special provision for women and families. So the, the innovation we bring is not only finding the most suitable uh, application of renewable energy for the particular requirement, but also looking at how we can have additional impacts for the community and for the country as a whole. So that's a very interesting approach. So we're looking at a solution that's not only providing energy access, but actually providing much more value to the communities. So, so did that really happen? Do uh, you have... Have you seen this happening in action? Yes, yes we have. And if I can take you a bit outside of the scope, what is admirable about what the UAE has done and Mazda has done is that you're giving us assistance before a disaster has happened. What happens traditionally for us is everybody rushes to help 
the small islands who have been devastated by a hurricane to try to help them rebuild. But we need a lot less help rebuilding than we do need help before the event to make us more resilient. So in being putting these solar installations at the disposal of the Barbados Water Authority, which is the sole utility for the production of water in Barbados, which suffers from an unstable grid at present. So when the grid goes down, the water supplies go down. So you've launched the Barbados Water Authority's program to make itself entirely resilient and free from the electric utility. So that even if water become, even if electricity becomes unstable, we can still guarantee a supply of water to people. You can survive a long time without electricity. You can't survive very long without water. But I must commend the government of the UAE and Mazdar for its foresight in giving us assistance to develop our capacity to be resilient as opposed to sitting back like everybody else and offering the help after we've been struck by a, a climatic event. Tell me a bit more about capacity building. Did, you know, how, how did it help you to build human capacity within the Bahamas, did, within, within Barbados. your country, within Barbados? Did, did, did you, did, was there any training programs? Were there any capacity building initiati initiatives to help develop the human capacity? Um, they weren't specifically training programs, but capacity building is, it was um, constructed by Barbadians. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the, the projects that are going on in Barbados are using local resources, they're using local personnel who then gain further experience. So I guess it is capacity building. Absolutely. In yeah. a way. Yeah. Um, and as was indicated earlier, cricket is our major game. And we have one of the meccas of cricket in Barbados, which is called Kensington Oval. It is world famous. But it was constructed at a time when the thought of parking was not an issue. Okay. So now we have issues that when we have major games at Kensington, there's a shortage of parking. This car park has provided 100 plus spaces and also um, allows for electric vehicle charging. So it's, it's a great innovation that meshes technology it meshes culture, it meshes sport, and it incorporates what is good for the community. So it, it was a, a great initiative. Fantastic. Adel partnerships, and ADFD has been creating great partnerships around the world, and they helped develop, you know, we had, we had you managing the, the, the Caribbean Fund, but they also the Pacific Fund before that, and the, the IRENA Facility Fund that you, we, we just celebrated the, the announcement of a seventh cycle. Uh, tell me more, how, what's your approach? How, how, how do you go around creating such partnership? You know, who, who are your main stakeholders in those partnerships? Interesting, Dr. Anwar. See, partnership is uh, stated clearly in the mission of the Abu Dhabi Fund. And as, as you mentioned, we work closely with the most, uh, all of the uh, international, regional, and also local uh, development stakeholders to ensure that and we because we believe that uh, uh, something we cannot do it ourselves we have to join forces to join hands for a better future of the uh, partners uh, countries and it might uh, worth uh, mentioning that uh, uh, one of the of the uh, successful uh, partnership that uh, uh, the UAE Pacific Partnership Fund this is a, a similar uh, funds to the UAE Caribbean Renewable Energy Fund. Uh, 11 countries, uh, 11 projects, 50 million US dollar, uh, all, all completed and uh, in close cooperation between uh, Abu Dhabi Fund, between uh, masters, uh, other uh, beneficiary countries. And that leads to uh, outstanding uh, uh, results, honestly. Fantastic. Bodhi, we, we heard about innovation in, uh, in, in muscle projects around you know, both the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands, but I, I want to speak specifically about creating projects that is climate resilient, has climate resilient features. Can you elaborate a bit more about those such, such elements or such features in the UAE CREF uh, projects? Thank you, Dr. Nawal. Uh, particularly for island nations that are lots more susceptible to the impacts of uh, climate change. 
in the projects that we're now deploying, that's a key component of our design parameters. So all the projects in the Caribbean now have a specific climate resilience uh, aspect. How we do that without getting too technical? All the projects, they're designed to withstand hurricane winds up to about 160 miles per hour. So what that means is that uh, the structures that support the projects now have to be a lot more robust. All the structural elements, they're designed to withstand hurricane winds. And one of them, one of the projects that we've already completed in the Bahamas, that has already been put to the test. There was a hurricane uh, about nine months ago, and the structure very, very much withstood those uh, winds. It wasn't a full force hurricane, but the structure was uh, intact. So going forward now, we do our very best to make sure that uh, most hurricanes, the, the plants that we build, can withstand that. Also, another aspect of uh, resilience that we're building is to maximize, to optimize the use of renewable, renewable resources. We're building on the expertise and on the availability of the market uh, of solar PV plants, but also of batteries. So on the island nations now, Another innovation that we're looking to deploy is the use of batteries. So in the projects that we have in uh, St. Vincent, we've been able to design a system that also has a small battery component such that throughout the daytime, we can now have solar inputs. We don't have to rely on diesel gensets. So during the day, the diesel gensets are switched off and we now have backup supply from a battery such that we can optimize the use of solar systems. Fantastic. So. Your Excellency, you are a Minister of Water and Energy, and the water and energy nexus is very important to the UAE. But why water and energy are connected in, uh, in your case? Well, it's an interesting story. It has never been a joint ministry before in Barbados. <clears throat> we had a crisis with water okay. um, when the government came into power two years ago. And also, the Prime Minister had a vision to take the country to 100% renewable by 2030. So I guess it is a case of the Prime Minister placing a lot of faith in me and dropping on me the two heaviest ministries. We have a saying that the Lord does not give you more than you can bear. I just wish he did not trust me so much. <laughs> I'm sure he, he did for the right reasons. <laughs> but it, it, is, it is a natural synergy. Yeah. And it, it goes entirely with our vision to develop our water sector um, and the 100% renewable by 2030, they mesh very handsomely together. So it makes my life simple in trying to do renewable energy projects while trying to fix water and linking them to each other. Fantastic. Uh, Adil, can you give us an update on where are we with, with the, with the uh, Caribbean projects? How many projects are already in, in, implemented or in the process of implementation? What are the ones that are, you are most excited about? Um, maybe this information is more with the, my colleague from Masdar, but uh, so far uh, three projects out of uh, 16, it's been almost completed, but maybe uh, my colleague Aysen can okay. elaborate more on this since they are the project manager of the... Of Thank the you, Mr. Adel. Uh, the Caribbean Fund entails 16 projects, 16 countries, We've already completed the first three in uh, Bahamas, Barbados, and also St. Vincent and the Grenadines. They are all completed and inaugurated. This year, we are planning to embark on five new projects, the first one being in Antigua and Barbuda, and also Dominica. And then we'll roll it over the next uh, two years. The Antigua and Barbuda project, again, is going to be an exemplar. And just building upon the comments from uh, Adel earlier about partnerships, it's quite a unique project that's uh, primarily funded by the UA Craft Fund, but also we're able to build on the partnerships with New Zealand, building on what we did with them in uh, one of the projects in the Pacific, and also the uh, Caribbean Development Fund. So that's a unique example of where partnerships have all come together to more than double the size of the initial funding and have a lot more impact on the project in Antigua and Barbuda. So we've completed three projects. We are planning on embarking on five more uh, this year and then next they're rolling on to the next phase. Fantastic. We spoke about these projects and how they are helping accelerate SDG 7 uh, partnership, but there is one goal that is, for me personally, is very important, and, and the UAE has uh, put a lot of emphasis on, which is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 5. Uh, the international community committed to achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls by 2030. 
I would like to hear your, your, your opinions. And, and do you agree that there are significant opportunities for a greater gender balance in the global energy transformation to renewable energy? Very leading question. I don't know how you can say no, I don't think so, but I would want to see. Are you, are you starting with me? <laughs> well, you are. You, are. you have two very important cabinets, so yes. So, interestingly enough, Barbados is perhaps that country where there is no issue of um, gender equality. Our Prime Minister is now a woman. Our Governor General is a woman. The leader of government business um, in the House is a woman. I think there are far more women now employed than men. There are more women in university than men. So I think if you actually take the score sheet, we pass that one entirely. I'm probably going to start fighting for the rights of men very shortly. But, but looking closely at, 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 at the sector, at renewable energy and sustainability, we, yesterday we, uh, uh, we had a panel uh, on, on WISER, which is Movement and Sustainability, Environment and Renewable Energy. And the statistics, and we launched the report, IRENA launched its report on, uh, on the status of uh, statistics on, on, on women in the industry. And, and the statistics, better than traditional energy, where, where gender is, or women are, uh, only 20, 22%, I think. We are here around 32% when it comes to, to renewable energy. Do you see um, more opportunities for women in the sector, and why? Yes, there, there are lots of women getting into the energy space um, in Barbados, and actually the water space as well. Mm -hmm. Now, renewable energy is the newest big thing in Barbados. It's a great investment opportunity. Um, they're trying to encourage investment in the sector and a lot of women and women's groups are looking to use that as an investment vehicle. We are also seeing companies led by women applying for licenses to do renewable energy projects in Barbados. But once again, it just provides another opportunity for the ladies who are very, very forward thinking back home. So it, it has enfranchised people and has also given them an avenue um, for self-betterment and wealth generation. So as in opposition, I'm going to come back to, to, to you, uh, Adel and, and, and Bodhi, in a minute. But as, as a policymaker yourself uh, and, and, and a government uh, leader, uh, what, in your opinion, what steps can leaders in this sector do to ensure and promote more diversity and inclusion in this sector? Um, let's not be ashamed or embarrassed about it. We can set quotas. We set quotas for most other things to ensure some balance in the society. And you can set quotas or give points in the award of contracts or deciding who gets contracts based on what percentage of women you have, how is your company structured, what opportunities are advanced for women, if you have any social programs as well attached to your project that can enfranchise women in Barbados. The most vulnerable would include single mothers. We have a large single mother um, percentage in Barbados. So a lot of the government's policies are aimed at making sure those households are not unfairly disadvantaged and that the children are not left to suffer. So to ensure the, the participation of women in the sector and the benefit of single mothers or vulnerable families, then let's not be embarrassed. Put quotas on it. Bodhi, what do you think we very much, uh, leaders can do? We very much uh, buy into the vision of the UAE to empower women when it comes to uh, renewables. And it's something which we're very, very keen to ensure we reach that target on our projects. I think the Bahamas is a very, very good example. The, the criteria that some of the criteria we use include uh, making sure that the consultants who work with us and also the contractors, both local and international, have a very high proportion of women on the team. In the case of the Bahamas project, which we've now finished, the local team, the local team from the ministry was entirely women. It was all women-led, the design team, the management team, the contractors team, the project manager, and the project coordinator, they were women as well. So it's a, it's a criterion that we very much build into our projects and we try to make sure that we have a lot of women involved in the design and the planning and in the execution. So we can really build that capacity to then own and run this project by themselves in the future. Fantastic. Ada, anything you yes. ask? 
it's very interesting. So, uh, women empowerment is uh, already embedded in a UAE foreign aid strategy. And what we have done as a fund, if you've seen the UAE ADFD IRENA project facility, a UAE Pacific Partnership Fund, and also UAE Caribbean, we put the criteria in the guidelines of the selection of the projects. And one of these criteria is, uh, is encouraging, uh, uh, enhance, encouraging women, more women involvement in the projects. Whenever this happens, that the project will get higher score than others. So uh, it's already taken into account, and uh, it's part of our um, strategic direction uh, and link with the UAE uh, foreign aid strategy directions. Thank you so much, Adi. That's actually very inspiring. We heard from uh, beneficiaries, we heard from private sector, and we heard from donors, and we, we've seen clear alignment on why we are doing what we are doing, and we've seen a clear alignment on the benefits of such fund and the uh, results that basically then the, the nations benefiting from this project are uh, are, are, are reaping. We we did not hear we did not forget any of the important SDGs that are uh, high on the UAE's uh, on the UAE's agenda, including gender. So all our projects actually achieve much more than just the SDG 7. They have focus on all the other SDGs. Ladies and gentlemen, we've enjoyed a very, in, very interesting and very impressive discussion, and I thank you all for being with us. Please join me in giving our panelists a, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.